So I've been shooting with the Fujifilm X-H2S. I am loving this camera so much. Finally, it feels like it's been years, but finally I've got a camera that I can comfortably use as a hybrid shooter and uh, one that works for me. And I hope these settings will work for you too. So I'm using the 16 to 55 mil f 2.8 predominantly. Originally, I thought it was gonna be a great photography lens and I wasn't sure how well it was gonna work out for video because it's not an optical stabilized lens. And so that was the biggest thing that always held me back. But you know what? It's actually performed really well and the inbuilt stabilization on the camera has done so well to keep everything nice and steady, especially when out and about vlogging. Previously, I actually had the 16 to 80 mil f4. I had such a love-hate relationship with it. I actually sold it in the end. But between the 16 to 80 and this 16 to 55, I will take the 16 to 55 every single day. It is just so good, it's so sharp, such good quality. It's even wider aperture at 2.8. And you know what, 55 over 80 doesn't bother me all that much. One of the things I'm always trying to find is some sort of level like this. And uh, this might be perfect. So let me run through the equipment that I'm using uh, to make up my vlogs. And uh, I'm actually balancing the camera right now on this, I think it's like an electrical box. Uh, that is something that I try and find in all the cities that I'm out and about. I'm trying to find some sort of ledge that I can place the camera and get a static talking to camera shot. Um, so class that as equipment number one. <laughs> yeah, be fine. So the run through. So we've got the camera. This is the Fujifilm X-H2S. I've been using this for the last few months or so. Um, and I've been a Fuji shooter for, I think it's about seven years or so for photography now. And this is the first Fujifilm camera that I have fallen in love with for video. And uh, a little bit more on that later, but just to kind of put you in the picture that I've been waiting for this type of camera for so long from Fujifilm. And it is above and beyond blowing me away on so many things. I am loving this camera so much. Then we got the 16 to 55 f 2.8, and I've got two lots of filters on here. Now, the main one that I'm using is a variable ND filter, so a neutral density that is kind of like sunglasses for your camera. It just sort of dims the light down a little bit so you can shoot with a wider aperture in super bright and harsh conditions. I'm using one from Freewell. They actually sent this out to me close to a year ago now or so. I used it a lot on my Canon, my previous camera setup. I really enjoy it. It's not perfect. It's a magnetic system, so you can take off uh, and you can sort of build in your, your setup. So I'm using a ever so slight mist filter um, as the base of the VND. And then I've got a two to five, but it also comes with a kit of a, I think a five to nine stop. When I say it's not perfect, I'd like a fully magnetic system where I can just quickly whip it off when I go interior somewhere. Um, but unfortunately it doesn't do that. I still have to screw on the base and then you drop in and it's a little bit fiddly, but you know what, it's great. The big benefit though to this magnetic system is that when I take off the ND aspect of the top layer, the VND aspect, and you flip it around, suddenly that filter becomes a circular polarizer. I didn't even know that was how the physics worked on it. I didn't know that a VND could be a polarizer if you just invert it. That's how it works. And so now I've got a polarizer that I can take out and about with me, which is amazing. The second filter that I'm actually loading in before the VND, which I've only started doing again recently, is the Moment Cine Bloom. And this just kind of blooms some of the highlights, just softens the picture, just takes off a little bit of that digital edge and sharpness, um, which I find that the Fuji lenses, they are quite contrasty. Um, and so it just removes some of that sharpness and just gives it like a nice soft but sharp look. Um, and I really enjoy the aesthetics of that. As soon as you put it on, just softens it ever so slightly. And uh, yeah, nice and, and comfortable. It's a bit of a heavier contrast, bit of a softness. So as you can see with the filter on and off, just with the yellow, it's kind of blooming a little bit and it's just kind of nice sort of softness to things. If you're doing this in photos, then it's quite destructive. Of course, you can do this in Photoshop and you can blur things, you can kind of spread the color a little bit. But in video, you don't have as much control. And so that's why doing it optically with the lens is actually quite important and quite powerful. You can overdo it though. And then in terms of audio, I'm using the Rode VideoMic NTG and I've created a dual mic system and I get asked so many times about this and I'm pairing it with a DJI Osmo mic and I'm splitting the channels. I'm actually gonna do a video dedicated entirely to how that's made because honestly, so many people ask me about my little dual mic setup um, and I think it's 
Well, I've had it for years and it's been so invaluable to me. But the video mic NTG has been easily the best on-camera microphone that I've used in years. The audio quality and the sort of fullness to the audio that you get in comparison to the previous video mics, it's just been amazing. I love the quality you get from it. I've grown and trained my ears into how it sounds and everything that I'm able to EQ it and do all my settings in Premiere almost identically across my videos with just little tweaks and things. Uh, and I've got the sound that I like. Um, so I'm really happy with the audio that I'm getting. And uh, because it's the same mic that I've used for the last three and a bit years or so, or two and a bit years, no matter which camera I'm using, it on, I can get the same sound profile. Audio itself is probably the most overlooked thing for a lot of people when doing videos. For me, it's one of the most, if not the most important aspect of my video making. And so being able to use the same microphone across different cameras and you can get the same results from it because, you know, it's, it's a piece of gear, it has its own character. That's one thing that a lot of people forget about. You know, if you change camera systems, you'll maybe change lenses, you get different usability, you'll get a different image from it. Whereas being able to use the same microphone, you can get the same sound. It's familiar and I love it. And then the final thing in my setup uh, is my tripod grip, which I'm using and holding right now. So again, I've had this for a few years. This is the Sure 3T15K, I believe. It is quite pricey for a small tripod, but you know what? Just the sheer quality of it, it's been worth it. Uh, and it's an Arca Swiss, so I've converted pretty much all my cameras to Arca Swiss mount. Um, so I can just keep the same plate and I can go from things like the uh, Peak Design capture clip onto this tripod, onto other tripods, uh, because they all use the same plate. And the legs on the tripod, they go from a super wide to a kind of narrow version, um, so you can get like a little bit of height or a bit more stability, depending on which you prefer. Um, and yeah, does the job, really happy with it. And the only issue is in the winter, because it's metal, man, does it get cold. But you know what? You just gotta deal with it and wear gloves. So as a hybrid shooter doing both photo and video, in a hybrid camera, there's quite a few specifics and a few things that I'm just like really particular about needing. And so predominantly, the biggest thing is I want convenience, I want speed, and I want reliability. And this camera has done that for me. And it's all thanks to one aspect of the camera, which is probably the most controversial part of the camera itself. And that is little custom dial friend over here. So the C1 through C7 has saved so much time and has just made this camera incredibly usable for me. I get though, if you're a diehard Fujifilm shooter, you probably hate this dial. You don't want the PSAM dial, you want the ISO dial and you want your shutter speed dial and other things. As a hybrid shooter, this makes it for me. And the reason is simple. When you shoot video and when you shoot photo, you actually need two different setups. In video, you typically use the same shutter speed through all your clips. When you're doing photos, quite often, in most cases anyway, you want as fast a shutter speed as you can get uh, to really just freeze the frame and get the sharpest image if you're going for that sort of look. And so you don't want that in video because that makes the image look really janky and just really kind of over sharp and a bit too sports-like. And so having to change all your dials between them bit of a problem. So having custom modes on here, C1 to C7, now I know this isn't new, but none, in my eyes anyway, have had seven variables. Now that may sound like a lot to a lot of people, but as a hybrid shooter, this is so important to me, and I could maybe even have C10 if I wanted to. So I've got my C settings set up for certain amounts of settings for either video modes or photo modes. Let's do the rundown on my C1 through to C7. So, C1. This is what I use for my vlogging setup when I'm holding the camera. Uh, so the key settings that I'm using in this mode is I'm shooting in the 6.2K 3x2 aspect ratio open gate. So it gives a more square look so I can actually zoom in if I want to. I can reposition if I place it down. I've got 6K resolution that I can reframe and just cover up some of the messy cuts and stuff in between things. I'm shooting in F-Log2, which by the way, I am loving. The quality of the grading is so useful and so enjoyable to use. And I've got my shutter speed set to 1 100th of a second. The reason I have it slightly higher for a 25 frames a second video is because sometimes I need to capture a frame as a thumbnail. And so it's just a little bit sharper if I've got it 1 100th of a second versus the 1 50th. And also it just looks a little bit cleaner and tidier uh, when talking to camera. And uh, my aperture, of course, I set on the lens and that changes depending on the scene. And I'm using auto ISO 
and uh, that just fits the environment. Quite often I'm using auto white balance and depending on the time of day or how I'm feeling on the day to be honest, I may go for a white priority or an ambient priority, depending on what fits uh, with the vibe of the video. Sometimes I'll do a fixed white balance entirely and that could be a fixed white balance to say match the sun as it's a sunny day or a cloudy day if you want to just warm up the picture a little bit. Or I'll do a fixed Kelvin if I want to add a little bit of drama to an image, I'll maybe cool down the picture color and, and other things like that using the white balance. And so this is all graded in F-Log2 uh, and I do that in Premiere so there's no picture profile settings that are taking effect in that. And for autofocus, I'm using the eye detect and uh, it works pretty well. I'm actually really pleased with how well it works. Um, sometimes if you've got a busy background, it does pulse on the background a little bit, but for the most part, I find it actually detects my face and uh, holds onto it really well. I'm using the slowest on the speed for autofocus and the strongest on the tracking in terms of the settings. So I think it's like a plus four and a minus five or something like that. When I set the camera to C2, this is what I use for my B-roll, my outward filming. So I use this if I wanna film uh, anything that's happening in front of me, and this is in 50 frames a second. So I use 50 frames a second because if ever I wanna slow things down, I've got the option to slow it down 50% and to bring it back to a 25 frames a second timeline. Most of the time, I actually don't do that, and so the clips that you see, they are technically 50 frames a second. And I've also set the shutter speed to 1 one hundredth of a second, so it matches up with the vlog footage. And so the actual individual frames themselves, they don't change their appearance when you're looking at them. Um, they're always capturing the same amount of light. And so the settings that I have between C1 and C2, ambiently, is identical. And so the only thing that's different really is it's 50 frames a second and it's in DCI 4K. So it's a 17 by nine aspect ratio, which is what I publish in at the moment. C3 is pretty much identical to C2, except for one thing. And that is, this is in slow-mo. So I use C3 for slow-mo and that's hundred frames per second. I do set my shutter speed to one two hundredth of a second, so in terms of switching between C2 and C3, it does get a little bit darker, so I have to compensate with a bit more ISO or a slightly wider aperture, um, but otherwise, it's 17 by nine and that's slow-mo. So, my three main video modes, we've got vlogging, C1, B-roll, C2, slow-mo, C3. And in my slow-mo mode, I do use the autofocus as well, and it works pretty well. I'm actually surprised at how well autofocus works in slow-mo, but you know what? It does a good job. And all of my video settings, by the way, they're all in 10-bit 422, and I use 360 megabits per second on the video format. They're all in H.265, so that's actually a pretty good data rate. C4, I use for photography. So this is how I remember it. In terms of the dials and the sort of traditional Fujifilm feel to things, most of my control is on the lens with the aperture mode. So for photography, I'm in aperture priority and I shoot RAW plus JPEG and I've got some custom uh, film simulation recipes that I'm working with. I do shoot the RAW still though, if I want a backup, if I want to edit those photos and just push them further and use some of my Lightroom presets and like, make some sort of bigger edit on things. So I did previously do a video about my X-T4 on how I use it for photography setup. I've transitioned all of those settings and not much has changed into my X-H2S. And so if you wanna go and check out my photography settings, I've got that video linked in the description. This camera, however, is significantly faster than my X-T4 was. The viewfinder as well is a much better experience. The X-T4 was good but this one is excellent. So at the moment on C4, I've been rocking my Cozy Chrome variation of my JPEG simulations, and that's doing me really well for daytime and nighttime shooting. Sometimes, uh, particularly at nighttime, I'll actually set a fixed white balance and just change things ever so slightly during the day, um, but I'm still using a little bit of a color shift in that setup. And I should also point out that for saving the data, I'm shooting the images to the SD card and the video to the CF Express card. So when it comes to importing at the end of the day, I know which cards for video and I can just plonk it in and I can get all the footage off and then I can put my SD card in and I can get all the images in Lightroom. C5 is another photography one and this one I've preloaded it with my Superstone JPEG recipe. I have to be honest though, since being in Japan, I've used it maybe once and <laughs> I, I've just 
I don't really have a use for those uh, those colors and that image setting and setup. So I'm actually contemplating whether I set my C5 to a flexible spot and I'll maybe switch between a photo and video. Uh, maybe I'll use like a video one with a bit more of a color shift. Um, but I know that when I head back to the UK, I'm gonna be wanting my C4 and my C5 to go between the two different JPEG styles. For C6, this is what I've been using for my vertical video. So this one, I actually set to 1080p. And likewise on the camera, it doesn't matter whether you film in vertical or horizontal, it will automatically flip the video file for you. So the key points for C6, I'm baking in the color, so I'm not using F-Log2, and I'm shooting in 1080 because it gives a slightly smaller file size, which means that when you put it on Instagram, it doesn't compress it anywhere near as much, and you get a nice, clean picture with your colors good to go. There's no grading required and it's just a seamless approach. So I'm just bringing the highlights down to a negative two and I'm bringing the shadows to a negative one. So the number actually is opposite to what you think. And so it actually raises the shadows just a little bit and it brings the highlights down so that they don't clip and it just flattens it ever so slightly because uh, the film simulation that I'm using is classic chrome, which is a little bit contrasty. And so those shadow highlights just sort of balance it a little bit. I'm using color plus two, so it just adds a little bit of vibrance because again, classic chrome is quite uh, contrasty and low saturation. So I just boost the color ever so slightly and the sharpness I've set to negative four. And so it just removes some of that digital edge on things. And the dynamic range I've set to 400 just to maximize the availability of light and shadow detail. And I think as a picture profile, this looks great out of camera. It is inflexible though. So if unfortunately the highlights do clip or it's a little bit too dark, changing it in post-production, you don't have as much flexibility as you do if you shoot log. C7 is pretty much identical to C6 in terms of the color profile. But the key thing here is this is in DCI 4K. So this is the 17 by nine. So it's a larger resolution, but it's baking in the color. Now, the reason that I have this is because if I need to do any super quick video where I just don't really have much time to edit, I don't have much time to grade, and I just wanna have the colors and everything good to go, that's where this comes in. Because the colors out of the Fuji, they are beautiful, they are lovely to work with, and I can see it on the camera. So what you get here, is what you get in the end result. Give or take a couple of little tweaks. It doesn't take too much effort to do. Um, so yeah, C7, C6, very, very similar. C6 is just 1080, so it reduces some of that compression when it goes to Instagram. In terms of custom buttons on the camera, I'm actually using most of the default. So we've got the printed buttons for ISO, white balance, and then I haven't really set too many custom buttons up, so they kind of help me out here. So on the top, this is what I'm using for face detect on and off. So I can easily just toggle face autofocus on and off. That's great if I'm filming myself or if I hand the camera to someone else and uh, they want to take pictures or video uh, and I can make sure it's in focus. And then the other notable thing is my AF on button. I've set that to an AF L button. So I actually lock the focus. So when I'm filming quite often, uh, especially if I'm filming outwardly, I'll hold that, it just locks the focus and if I reframe, it won't refocus. I must admit, the AF on being used as an AF L button is sometimes a bit buggy. Doesn't always operate as expected. Doesn't always lock the focus. And so it will sometimes go to autofocus. And that's really annoying. I'm gonna feed that back to Fujifilm. So I've been absolutely loving my X-H2S for hybrid photo and video. If you want to know a deeper dive into how I use Fujifilm for photography, then this is the video for you. It is about my X-T4, but most of those settings and controls have come across onto the X-H2S as well. And I think you'll really enjoy this one. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in another Japan video super soon. See you later, bye bye.